Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Kampanek. I am the Director of Global Programs at the Center for International Private Enterprise, or SITE. And it is my pleasure to moderate today an excellent panel of experts from around the world. We will be talking um, about how to accelerate and protect democratic transitions. Um, very timely topic indeed, as we all know. Uh, the state of democracy uh, around the world is in flux, uh, yet even amid, amid the general um, global decline in democracy over the last 15 years, um, there are democratic openings and opportunities that are worth uh, exploring and learning from. Uh, that is our purpose for today. Um, there is no set path or one uh, direction to transitions necessarily. Um, and indeed, uh, within and across countries, um, contestation occurs uh, in multiple spaces. There's competition of ideas, um, you know, institutions, um, economic models, uh, technology. Uh, all those issues play into the success uh, or challenges that uh, democratic transitions uh, face. Um, at the high level, we see uh, mutually reinforcing tendencies um, of open market economies and democracies. Uh, but we need a much clearer understanding of how uh, changing economic models and business decisions, business uh, behavior, uh, impacts the uh, arenas in which uh, democracy and authoritarianism, uh, or perhaps uh, in other dimension, rule of law and corruption, um, vie for dominance. Uh, so in this panel, we will be taking uh, both um, a global look and also comparing um, countries uh, in uh, varying geographies and varying transition circumstances, uh, in each case analyzing the factors uh, that can accelerate the transition or um, help protect values uh, and institutions of uh, nascent democracies and markets. Uh, joining me today, I have an excellent uh, panel uh, whose uh, detailed bios you can uh, explore in uh, this online platform. Uh, so let me just briefly take a moment to uh, introduce them, and we will turn uh, to our discussion. Um, first, let me welcome Abigail Bellows, uh, the non resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, let me also welcome Mashdi Hassan. Um, he is the executive counselor at l'Institut Arab. the chef d'entreprise, in my best French. Uh, I tend to <laughs> go with the... Uh, IACE um, acronym as a non-French speaker. Uh, next, uh, we have Luis Rubio, um, chairman of uh, Mexico Evalua. And uh, last but not least, Ali Salman, uh, founder and executive director of uh, Policy Research Institute uh, of Market Economy, also known as PRIME, uh, based in Pakistan. Uh, welcome, very good to see you virtually. And um, let's get started. Uh, just mentioned to uh, the audience also that this session uh, is being recorded. And during the panel discussion, uh, you can start using the Q&A function uh, to enter your questions uh, for the panel. And also questions can be upvoted. So if you already see the same question or very similar question that somebody else asked, uh, you can um, help move it up to the top. And I will be uh, had to, to bring your question up to the panel. Um, all right, uh, let's get started. So um, the question um, will be the same uh, for the whole panel. Um, you know, what's the key issue for democratic transition that you see um, either in your country or region or perhaps more globally? Um, and uh, what are the best openings and opportunities to accelerate and protect democratic transition? I'll turn it over first to Abigail, given your global perspective and, 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 and international experiences. Um, over to you. Thanks, Anna, and it's a pleasure to be here with such a great panel. Um, so the issue that I focus on and that is so key for democratic transition is corruption, uh, which you mentioned earlier. It has really pernicious effects on democratic transition. It slows growth. It leads to citizens often becoming disillusioned with even the prospect for reform. And we really do see some exciting openings, uh, moments when external actors can infuse some energy and support around windows of opportunity for reform. Um, this is a moment where there um, 
maybe an opening because of some uh, corruption scandals on the ground, mass protests, um, which have actually been sparked in 32 countries over the past three years on corruption issues. Um, and it could be a change in administration as a result of that political momentum, or um, even uh, as we saw in Armenia, quite dramatic, uh, what they call a velvet revolution. Um, so these are moments when there's an organic spike in political will, and they're really an opportunity to surge support towards governance reform. And the challenge is that often the international community doesn't have the resources and isn't equipped to respond as nimbly and, and quickly and, and necessarily um, robustly as uh, should be provided during those moments. Um, certainly the US government is working to try to rectify that uh, from Congress. Um, they're considering creation of a new anti-corruption action fund as part of the Crook Act that's pending on the Hill. Um, other donors are also exploring this, Open Society Foundations and others. How do you surge support during a moment when governance and, and democratic transition is really on the line? Um, and those re and I think part of the um, takeaway from this for me is that democratic transition often doesn't happen incrementally. Um, we should sometimes take a long-term perspective, but change often comes in waves and in spikes over the years. And so I think it can be very important to be prepared for those moments and be able to respond strategically when they open. Apologies, uh, broke up um, at the end <laughs> there for, for me, but I, I think the gist of, of the answer. Was there anything else you wanted to add at this point? Sorry if it broke up, just that um, these are important moments to respond strategically um, when they occur and to be able to surge support to those on the front lines. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, let me uh, turn it over to uh, Mashdi and um, you know, up to you if you would like to uh, perhaps start with sharing the experience of uh, Tunja or maybe highlight more the, um, the opportunities you see or perhaps challenges or both uh, more broadly in the... Thank you. I think what's happened now in Tunisia, it's a, it's a real and good uh, uh, school case. And uh, what we have in terms of democratic transitions uh, as problem, as, 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 as issue, like we can, we can after see it in other country, but uh, with other, other matters. And uh, I think there are three, three key, uh, key issues to, uh, uh, to discuss. The first one is governance, and uh, I completely agree with uh, Abigail about it. And uh, for, for governance, um, they are a problem of corruption, but I think uh, in terms of the uh, governance institutions, and uh, for example, in the case of Tunisia, we say that we have just to complete the implementations of uh, the democratic and constitutional and constitution uh, bodies like constitutional courts. And uh, when we have all of that, we can have we, we can achieve and we can see the result of uh, the uh, democratic transitions. But I think the problem is more deep than that. It's not questions that to implement that, but in terms of the effectiveness of, uh, of uh, this uh, kind of, uh, of governance and also the relations uh, between this uh, uh, regulations uh, body, government, uh, national assemblies, and uh, I think the main problems, even in terms of prosperity, in terms of reforms, is the relations between the governments and the, and the public administrations. We have to uh, review this, uh, uh, these relations, and uh, this, uh, this is very important. The second one is uh, uh, reforms, and the capacity to implement reforms is very, is very, is very important. And I think uh, now, in terms of transition, it's not the case because we have a weak system and we have a weak state and we cannot implement them only. But you have uh, uh, to, uh, to have the capacities to, uh, in terms of institutions and also in terms of disseminations and convince the populations about that. And I think the actual, uh, perhaps, regimes and uh, now with the enhancements of the populism Tunisia and also around the world, many of them they say they have we can we can have the shortcuts and we don't need to make all these uh, reforms. 
the third point, the third uh, challenge or issue that we can consider them as a, what, what we like is inclusions. I think uh, um, the problem is uh, 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 how, how the, uh, the, uh, the new, uh, the new political regimes and political system can be in, uh, more inclusive or, uh, or not. And the problem is perhaps people and the populations, now they, are, um, they, are, uh, they, are, they have some resistance because even after the COVID-19, they, they, uh, they see that they are not uh, uh, this, for example, democratic transition permit to be more inclusive, and especially if you add to that all digital transformations. I think that, uh, they, they are the, 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 the three issues in Tunisia. They are um, we have uh, we have now focus more in terms of uh, of reform and even in terms of governance. We have uh, um, uh, the problems political problems between uh, between um, uh, the three. Uh, the three, the three presidents, and uh, also in terms of uh, 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 the role of the private sector that we can discuss. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Luis, let me turn it over to you for a perspective from Latin America. Thank you, Anne. Um, in Mexico, there are two uh, key issues that have been part of the democratic transition of the past decades. One has to do with the conflict of visions. The other, far more transcendent, is the consequence of an incomplete transition, namely the problem of governance. The conflict of visions stems from the negotiations that took place from 1996 on to set the stage for a professional institution to run, manage, and rule over elections that were a permanent issue of bickering among the parties. This was accomplished and Mexico now has an exceptionally competent electoral bureaucracy that also serves as the arbiter and tribunal of elections. Despite this, it has not garnered complete legitimacy because the political parties continue to argue that an election is democratic only when they win. This is particularly the case of the now ruling party Morena. This is the result of two uh, conflicting visions. One sustains that the transition ended the day that there were clean and contested elections, allowing for a peaceful change of power. The other argues that the nature of the political system has not changed in nature despite the alternation of political parties in government. The real issue is the capacity of the government to govern and doing so in an accountable way. Mexico used to have a fairly competent system of government in a semi-authoritarian political system. It gradually lost its competence till the point of creating a series of financial crises starting in the 1970s that forced political change. In so doing, it lost its ability to govern. Conceptually, a, govern a country's progress depends on the existence of a competent government, an efficient system of accountability, and the democratic electoral system. The problem for Mexico is that the order in which these factors arrived uh, was not the right one. Democratic access to power arrived before a competent state was built and that produced the current paralysis, dysfunction and potential instability. All right, thank you so much. Uh, initial part and we'll we'll come back uh, to you for uh, maybe um, uh, more details and more context as we uh, go along. Um, let me turn it over to you now for uh, your perspective, uh, either from Pakistan or broadly from South Thank you so much, uh, Anna. Um, I'll be speaking mostly uh, from uh, like what's happening in Pakistan in the last uh, few years in terms of uh, democratic transition. Uh, at the outset, I would like to note that uh, it is, I think, well known that uh, you know, in, the, in terms of Pakistan, the role of military has been there historically, uh, which has uh, been recognized as a challenge to political stability and democratic uh, strengthening um, uh, for, for many decades. Uh, but it seems that we are moving uh, past that stage now. And uh, since um, 
we are having the third successive democratically elected government which is uh, currently uh, running the country um and uh, uh, the second uh, i would say in terms of the change or the transition is that uh, this government is uh, led by imran khan uh, who uh, comes from sort of a non traditional political uh, background uh, as a former cricketer um, and a social worker he founded a party Uh, about 22 years ago and and finally stepped to power uh, about 2 or 3 years ago 3 years ago and so this is a um, I, i would say um, a change uh, which we are observing as far as political leadership is is concerned um, and um, you know this the second i think uh, with this change is what is happening in the traditional political parties uh, party of bhutto and the party of sharif uh there is also a change in the political parties in in that case that is the sort of the old generation is fading away and a new generation is is coming up um, ironically the 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 new generation in most of the cases is um, the same families so same families are dominating in the traditional political parties of pakistan where whereas we we have seen the emergence of uh, one or two major new political parties so i would say that this is a good sign for a uh, democratic transition but also um, we are aware that um, it's not that the army is is um, taken an absolutely back seat they uh, some commentators call it a hybrid state where uh, they are um supporting the change um uh, in 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 some ways but they're not in in the um, in the front so um so that 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 is i think a part of the transition and we hope to have a situation in the future uh, by the next elections in in couple of years time that we have uh, that we see more stronger democratically run political parties uh, which can compete uh now along with this democratic transition and political development um uh, we also see uh, economic changes um 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 we we also see in some case uh, improvements in some case uh, economic reforms coming back on the agenda and um and i would also like to especially mention uh, the issue of corruption and the issue of accountability has been uh, quite up on this government uh, agenda uh, that what was the, that was actually one of their main slogans to come to power that uh, they would take uh, they would reduce or control corruption and they would sort of um, uh, you know uh, bring back uh, the wealth which according to them was looted by the the previous political uh, leaders uh, you know although uh, the corruption the the anti corruption process the accountability accountability process um uh, is seen by many as as political driven but still in terms of narrative uh, the anti corruption is big on narrative and to the extent that um, i personally believe that um, sometimes important goals of economic development might have been ignored by the top political leadership so if the prime minister has uh, let's say a limited resource call a political capital he might have been spending too much of political capital on fighting corruption and too less uh, of his political capital in solving the economic problem solving uh, the issues of ad- ad- addressing the issue of un- unemployment or poverty for for instance so um, there is a catch while the country is moving towards democratic strengthening and uh, pakistan is seeing an acknowledgement of the issues of corruption but then we we might also be having a trade off uh, between a, uh, a strong emphasis on on economic development which seems to be gone uh, into the you know uh, back burner at the moment so that's the sort of uh, i think the transition we are observing um and there are also um, interesting political developments uh, within uh, the political culture of of the country uh, to which i would like to uh, uh, refer in and our further discussion but i think that these examples 
uh, clearly show the tensions which through which the the Pakistani democratic system is now undergoing. Thank you so much, Ali, and many thanks to everybody for your great insights. So, so quite a bit uh, about key components of uh, successful democratic transition, starting from the very basic one uh, that Luis spoke about, full transition power, um, integrity of elections. But as we all know, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for democracy to force. So we talked about um, the issues of governance in many aspects, um, capacity of the government uh, and uh, administration to actually uh, carry out reforms. Um, and uh, Ali, you also touched on the dynamic of things. So I wanted to spend a little bit more time on that. Uh, and perhaps I'll, I'll let you continue uh, with your thoughts. But um, my second question to the panel is when we about the economics specifically, uh, how do those economics uh, and the role of the uh, business uh, in the country uh, relate um, to key issues um, of transition? Ali, I'll let you continue. And in particular, I thought it was really interesting what you mentioned about potentially a tension between focus on economic reforms and focus on corruption. That, that's perhaps not something we think about uh, any day. So and any aspect that you could expand upon or also tell us a bit more about the situation of uh, businesses in um, Pakistan and uh, how they factor into the um, democratic. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Uh, partly your vo voice was uh, breaking up, but I take it that you, uh, you want me to explore further the tension uh, between um, the reforms, uh, especially the anti-corruption reforms and the issue of economic development um, as the country moves towards democratic transition. So um, there are many examples, um, uh, you know, which we are seeing in, in this respect. Uh, now, uh, for instance, um, you know, Pakistan had uh, seen a se severe um, um, episodes of uh, electricity crisis power outages, um, significant challenge for businesses, for industries. They can't run uh, on, on full capacity because there was no, no enough electricity in the system. Now, in the, uh, in the previous regime, uh, former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, uh, especially uh, the, as part of the uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, Pakistan received significant investments in the power sector. And as a result, we had in, in our system, we had um, actually now more electricity than we need. So Pakistan has about 36,000 megawatt in, in, in the system, uh, which, is, which is more than we need at the moment. But now, um, so it, one would expect that this um, economic development can be actually used to further the, uh, the job creation process, the industrial activity and all that. So one needs to capitalize on this development. But instead, what I see the current government has done, uh, they have gone overboard in, um, in their zeal for anti-accountability, spending too much time on finding um, who is at fault in let's say, avoiding uh, contracts at a high rate, um, or let's say, why do we promise uh, um, a higher tariff to investors? Um, whereas the investors would say that, look, in Pakistan, no one was interested in coming to Pakistan given the situation of law and order. <laughs> and if an investor is coming in, it is coming in at a trade-off at a, let's say, when the government was offering higher tariff. But now the current government, a lot of effort was put in into uh, um, like um, uh, uh, you know constituting a commission inquiry, finding out corruption uh, in in all this, and I, and I, I thought that uh, and I believe that um, significant amount of time was wasted in uh, in finding um, these issues, um, and still they are struggling with it. While Pakistan, unfortunately. And having produced surplus electricity, cannot still uh, provide the electricity as per the demand. 
and we still have electricity outages and we still have businesses complaining that they can't uh, produce they can't have the electricity got into a competitive tariff so i think in this important sector uh, we see an example where an um, an over emphasis on on the on the, on the anti corruption efforts might be um, actually creating problems uh, for the economic development in the long run i hope i have addressed your your question anna yes thank you so much and i think i have to turn it over to abigail next for her her take on that um how do you see that from your experience uh any potential tension uh that ali um outlined between um you know the push to uh perhaps invest uh build and taking the time to step back you know examine the contracts set up the rules um make sure uh, all the anti corruption controls are in place when also on top in many countries we have in transition countries we have the issue of you know perhaps the new government uh maybe targeting the previous government uh for extra extra scrutiny for political uh, reasons what are your thoughts how how do we uh, balance uh, those uh, two necessities well i will leave to ali the particularities of the situation in pakistan i am no expert on pakistan um but i can say broadly um i do think that anti corruption while in the short term can make uh business transactions slower i think in the long term will yield dividends um but i think it's key to make sure that the process of oversight and scrutiny doesn't itself become another uh undue burden that then people will attempt to short circuit via bribes um and then the anti corruption infrastructure can itself become a uh, um opportunity for corruption and so to avoid that it's important to make sure that the um architecture is efficient and streamlined that there aren't unnecessary um sort of oversight steps but that it's an appropriate amount of um transparency and scrutiny um and that there are real checks on the process that there's impartiality so it's not just going after um you know the uh, kind of political opponents through using through weaponizing this anti-corruption architecture um but that it's applied even-handedly across the board to promote better competition um so that's my my two cents on um on the previous comments but um Anna do you want me to speak sort of more broadly as well to private sector yes, connections with absolutely that was, that was my, going to be my follow up okay um So I think that the role of the private sector at least vis-a-vis -vis corruption um as one dimension of the broader democratic transition it really does depend on the context um so we have some instances in which businesses are themselves perpetuating corruption whether it's the favored contractor with a certain cozy government relationship um of kickbacks and so on um but there are certainly plenty of other instances in which businesses are the victims of corruption um they are on the losing end of the um the bargain whether it's in terms of new and smaller firms that don't yet have those cozy relationships so they're struggling to break in um certainly foreign firms that are bound by foreign bribery standards from countries like the US that really enforce the law those firms may be deterred from even entering those uh foreign markets because uh they see the risks as too high um so there are definitely instances in which um that kind of uh foreign investment can be slowed and without that uh it's quite hard um for a fledgling government to write their economy start showing citizens that democracy can deliver because they don't have the flow of economic resources that can help make the case that democracy is proving better than the previous regime um and similarly in the public procurement system if it remains ridden with graft then public services continue to be subpar whether in terms of shoddy road construction or missing medical equipment in the midst of a pandemic as we've seen around the world um so again hard to make the case that democracy is delivering um in that sort of uh circumstance so i think it's important both for businesses and for democratic reform to um mobilize um in support of rule of law and anti-corruption reform during especially these moments of democratic transition 
But I also want to reflect more broadly about the framing of the conference and be curious about the links between free markets and democracy, or at least um, anti-corruption. I don't have all the answers, but I've been doing some reflecting on that nexus in preparation for our discussion today. And it seems that certainly too much government interference in the market can increase corruption risks, as we see in Venezuela and Egypt and other places where the military has extensive business holdings and an inadequate amount of private sector competition and government interference with private property and contract enforcement, those all increase the chances of collusion enormously and the quality of public services goes down. But there's also risks, I would say, at the other extreme in which pure free market approaches can accelerate corruption. If there's a lack of government involvement in regulatory oversight, that can enable law firms and accountants and others to turn a blind eye to money laundering uh, or argue that bribery is just the cost of doing business. Um, As we saw in post-Soviet states, a rapid government withdrawal from nationalized sectors can open the floodgates to those with political connections co-opting more and more resources while small and minority businesses lose out. And we see a similar story in the privatization of public services in Kenya and other places today, where privatization has meant more collusion, more decline in um, equitable and accountable services. So I think we have to be careful about um, the uh, assumption that free markets will automatically reduce corruption. I think it's really about making sure that free markets are bound by strong oversight and backed by independent judiciaries and an independent press, um, and that they can give support to some of the smaller economic players who are struggling to compete and have a fair shot. And I think when approached in that way, then that kind of political economic system can avoid the risk that free markets can pose, which is a consolidation of economic power in the hands of a few who thrive in a vacuum of government oversight And that can become really a hazard, not just in terms of illegal corruption, what we technically think of as corruption, but the way that many citizens in the U.S. and elsewhere use the term corruption, which is a sense that the system is rigged against them, a sense that they're unable to compete because of the power of big corporations, the power of politicians who are operating in the dark, and um, the sense that the little guy can't even uh, have a shot or hold the system accountable. And that uh, sense of um, the consolidation of economic and political power in the hands of a few and inequality more broadly, it poses a risk to democracy writ large. It's part of what's fueling the rise of authoritarian populism around the world. Um, And so we have to, I think, all collectively stand guard against that kind of inequality, uh, which can thrive potentially in the absence of sufficient government involvement. Thank you so much for that, Abigail. And I think we had to agree more that um, it's not enough to sort of lazy, fair style, remove government and somehow market institutes will naturally emerge. uh, What I think we have seen uh, empirically uh, all over the world is, um, in fact, the need for uh, you know thoughtful and painstaking, sometimes contentious design of institutions that can support the rule of law, that can support economic uh, inclusion, um, and for that uh, the, the involvement of different different parts of the society uh, is crucial. And there's definitely nothing automatic uh, about that process. Um, all right, let's let's uh, continue with uh, thoughts from our other two panelists. Are still on the same question: um, how economic factors, in your experience, uh, or the role of business uh, relate to the of economic uh, transition? Um, let's turn over to Mashdi. I mean, in Tunisia, one could argue that the, the root of the revolution uh, economic, right? It started with um, was easy uh, a food vendor who felt. Um, you know, wronged and 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 um, sort of, uh, felt being stuck um, that it literally became a spark of the revolution. How do you see the the economic factors in Tunisia's transition? Economic sector in Tunisia, you know, uh, like all the democratic transitions, and uh, when we compare Tunisia with other countries, and uh, people say. 
how we cannot have um, uh, the same, uh, same kind of reform or the economic growth. But we have to know that democracy in the, in the short term, you cannot take uh, the optimal reforms and the optimal decisions and you cannot have um, uh, the optimal uh, growth rate. But in the long term, we have uh, economic, uh, sustainable economic growth. But after that, all, all the other regimes, they have the crowning, they have, people, they have, they have other people who come and uh, the distributions of the wealth is not uh, enough, uh, uh, enough uh, fares and uh, their regime uh, fell, fell down. And just for, for this reason, all the time we have uh, to, uh, to, to say if it's, it's more difficult to have economic reforms when you have democracy and you have under, under uh, transition democracy, but it's more sustainable. And for this, we have, we have two points. Uh, the main problem is uh, private sectors have just to continue to uh, generate uh, value. Why I say that? Because now what happens in Tunisia and I uh, think in other countries that, uh, that we observe that, um, okay, um, we think that the private sector, they just take profit from the situations. They are not entrepreneurs. They just have uh, dominant positions, for example, in some sectors, and uh, they have um, uh, some close relations with, uh, with the political regimes, and all the times when we uh, discuss about private sector, that will be about, uh, we discuss about uh, corruption, we discuss about uh, dominant positions, and uh, that will be uh, um, real obstacles for the private sector to generate the jobs and also to invest more. And I think uh, the main uh, problems is we have, and I completely agree with Abgel, that uh, and even in ICE we define this position that uh, uh, um, uh, we have to uh, to play a role in terms of uh, combat corruption because uh, the main um, uh, that, that would be very uh, benefic uh, uh, benefit would be would be from uh, for the private sectors, but we have also uh, to work in term in term of uh, uh, the private sector image because uh, the problem is all the times that. Um, uh, we have problems that, that the break confidence. And with the break confidence, people stop investing and stop, uh, uh, and stop uh, uh, the entrepreneurship uh, mechanism stopping. And I think that will be uh, the, main, the, main, the main issue, especially after, after, after the COVID. And now we have uh, the emerge of the stagflation phenomena around the world because people uh, have the conception uh, uh, reductions under the war, uh, over the world, and uh, and also um, many companies they stopped productions. And uh, how we can um, uh, come back to, to the to the productions and to the investments, and uh, that will be uh, via private sectors and especially economic reforms. How we can do economic reform if we don't have a strong uh, democracy that and and we have institutions that will be. First, the first one. The second one is for for doing all of that. It's not question to have institutions, but you need funds to uh, to just uh, finance the reforms. And I think, uh, and even for example, in Tunisia, we, we work a lot about uh, to have to improve business environment or or for example, national strategies uh, uh, to combat corruption, etc. But all the times. We can, we, we can discuss about the legal framework, but we forget the so one important thing is we need budget for that and we need resources. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so, you know, I'm um, the um, architect of uh, Poland's economic transition, uh, Leszek Walcerowicz, um, used to say, you cannot be four mil against cows, uh, uh, illustrating the, uh, the uh, role of business in a transition in, in a way you just mentioned that you sort of cannot expect good economic results, but not be um, not create an environment where uh, enterprises can be formed, grow jobs and create growth. 
Um, let me turn it over to Luis for uh, your thoughts uh, on the question of the role of um, either economic factors more broadly or uh, the business uh, more specifically in a democratic transition. Thanks, Anne. Um, despite being uh, endemic, corruption uh, has not been a central factor of political transition. While I agree with Abigail on the broad point of prosecuting corruption for the long-term yield, most countries tend to use it for short-term uh, political gain only. And that has been the experience of Mexico recently. In fact, we have something very peculiar and, and, and quite amusing these days. The, the current Mexican government has neatly differentiated between previous corruption and the absolute impossibility of corruption today. Uh, the president uh, purifies any person caught in the act of corruption today. Does make it in, even worse because it becomes uh, hidden and it becomes a source of permanent uh, uh, criticism by the population that becomes ever more cynical. Going back to the broader point, a democratic transition in Mexico is 100% related to economic crisis. Uh, Mexico's whole political system had become an ever-growing obstacle to economic growth. And the government's excesses, particularly during the 1980s, led to the famous Mexican debt bomb in 1982, which started a series of crises in other countries uh, and resulted in a decade of almost hyperinflation, stagnation and political crisis. And that political crisis is what led to the political transition. Uh, it also led to an era of, of economic reforms, which revamped the economy and made it possible to create a strong and world competitive manufacturing base, mostly for, for export. None of these would have been possible without the United States' willingness to support the process uh, in, the pro in the form of, of what became NAFTA. More than a trade agreement, NAFTA was the foremost source of certainty for investors uh, supporting what we've just talked about, uh, about the need for having confidence and trust in, in, in the rules. So this was a unique space of uh, the rule of law a, an area of the country, not, not all the country, where the U rule of law actually reigned and where best practices, both in industrial terms as well as in labor practices as, and, and environment prevailed. Some with, uh, same with corruption and, and the fact that the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act applies to domestic firms as well. So the original objective of what became NAFTA was to isolate the economy from frequent political swings. Uh, in fact, its true worth was that it de facto tied the hands of politicians, hindering them from expropriating companies without cause or due process or changing the rules without proper notice. Unfortunately, Mexico did not carry out further reforms to make NAFTA a nationwide phenomenon. So it covered part of the economy only and part of the, con the, the country only. Nonetheless, economic liberalization in the presence of open and respected elections forced a political transition which drastically reduced the power of the central bureaucracy over the people. As I mentioned before, this also did away with, with the cap capacity to, to govern, which was nonetheless weakened long before that. Mexico, however, suddenly enjoyed press freedom like it had not uh, in almost a century. But the issue of governance has not been addressed, and that has become the foremost limit to further economic growth or political liberalization, because institutions are frail and must have now been neutralized or eliminated. Credibility in the government is low, and those private investment has contracted to its lowest level in decades. In all these, the private sector has been more spectator than, than, than actor, although it has been uh, very active in funding and supporting independent think tanks and non-government organizations and an important factor in the political transition. It has now retracted and it has itself become a target of the current president's attacks. Thank you so much, uh, Luis. And, and that actually, your remarks uh, tie nicely to um, next question. Uh, so you mentioned that the private sector in, in uh, Mexico uh, has not been 
particularly active and, and it's facing challenges in itself, um, you know, what is it that could uh, business community do? Is there anything more they could do uh, to help um, build the democratic institution? Well, the Mexican private sector has not been a protagonist in the political transition. In fact, many of Mexico's business people were very effective and successful players in the context of the old political system with a closed and protected economy and find themselves ill at ease in a democratic context. The latter does not mean they would rather return to the past as most have transformed themselves into formidable players in, in an open economy as competitors vis-a-vis -vis imports and, and also as multinationals investing in, in the Americas, the US and beyond. Uh, although some, too many, continue to play the role of cronies around the political system. Still, most Mexican companies were strong supporters of economic liberalization, less so in, in its, uh, its political twin. Yet, the current government's attacks on institutions, its relentless concentration of power in one person and continued assault on, on business, businessmen, companies, intellectuals, and opinion leaders has changed the environment. Having said this, the current uh, environment is far trickier than, than at any time in the past four decades. Whereas companies and their bosses enjoyed full freedom to express their views, and the government understood this was a natural order of things in an open economic regime, even if many disliked it. The current government has de facto reimposed restrictions on freedom of expression and is particularly keen on attacking companies that support institutions or activities that the government considers counter to its own interests or views. Hence, there's a tug of war that is the daily reality of, of Mexico today and has forced the private sector to be, to be much more politically active, but also to be much more careful in the way it acts and supports institutions, which becomes ever trickier. What the private sector does not have is a strategy to either legitimize its own role in the development of the country or to counter the president's incessant attempts to impose his views and to reach an hegemonic position in society. And I think this is the real challenge of, of, of society. Whereas the private sector was seen in the past to be the horse pulling the wagon using the famous Churchill uh, quip, today it is portrayed as a necessary evil. Profits are seen as illegitimate and big companies are th as a threat to, to, to the government. So in this context, what can the private sector do? I dare say that it is, sorry, that it is a for, its foremost challenge and its a necessary objective ought to be to develop a strategy to re-legitimize private enterprise, the role of private investment and investors and of markets at large, all in the context of an open and plural political system, but with a strong capacity to govern. Above all, it has to stop thinking, of, the private sector has to stop uh, thinking or dreaming of the next election to rather concentrate on the next decades. What is often said about politicians is equally applicable to private sector leaders. If they want to protect their livelihood and their hard-earned political freedoms, they need to become statesmen or stateswomen, not mere uh, business actors aiming for the next quarter. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and uh, let me turn the same question over to uh, Mashdi because you raised a similar concern of um, the, per the perception of the private sector in Tunisia as uh, becoming negative or too focused on uh, profiteering, the need for um, build more leg legitimacy and trust. Um, what are some ways uh, that you see private sector either doing it or if they are not doing it sufficiently what can be done better uh, I would be also curious to hear um, you know your experiences with uh, tools such as um, national business agenda where businesses come together to provide a constructive input constructive voice into um, the reform priorities but any anything else you would like to highlight uh, to the uh, role of 
Yeah, we have uh, the national business agenda, and uh, just today we have uh, the national assembly who uh, just adopted uh, the self entrepreneurs laws. After five years of work uh, under the national business agenda, we have uh, uh, today it's uh, it's adopted, and um, I think uh, for the private sector they are uh, th uh, three areas that we have to work on. Uh, the first thing is uh, working together and operations and working like international business agenda, be part of the reform and not just uh, support the reform. But that, that will be very, very, very important things uh, that will be uh, to have uh, to have to work on. The second things is in terms of image because and it's uh, we can understand people, especially in the country like where, where, when we have economic transitions. Everything changed in the countries, the president, the political party, even the civil societies, and the private sector, they're still there. The same, the same people, uh, they have the same films, and, and, uh, and people, they say, okay, they are in other revolutions, uh, we have new generations of private sectors, and uh, for the season, we have, we confiscate part of them, okay, they, they confiscate part um, companies of uh, the crownies, but all the other, uh, all the other uh, they, have, they have to continue to work. And I think the private sector, and I uh, agree with uh, Lewis, that uh, to legitimize uh, their roles. We, have, we are here, we have roles, and uh, to resolve all the problems in the countries, especially in the case of the country like Tunisia, that, that we don't have a natural resource, we need the value created by the private sectors and people they have to... Uh, uh, to understand what will be the role of the private sector, and it's very important. Especially, and that we have to not just to work in terms of just uh, um, to have a, a new brands of other active private sectors. I think we have to do it via entrepreneurships and helping new generations to be part of the private sectors and the importance of, of the private sector. In that, and for the season, even an ICE will try to work in that uh, because while uh, we work on entrepreneurships, we change the mindset of the all societies about the private sectors. And this is the second point that we have to work on. The third point is uh, the economic reforms. The economic reforms we have to just change the cost of the economic reforms, and the private sectors have. To take part of that, because we uh, we know that will be the cost very uh, that will be very important, and even in terms of the private sectors, in terms to support cost and also in terms of governance, I we, uh, we understand that uh, okay that that we can be in terms of uh, we see the short term uh, short term returns and but they need to uh, to have uh, a more long term visions and. Uh, like knowing that when we support now a part of uh, the cost of the economic reforms, that will be more sustainable and also useful for uh, uh, for uh, for the next generations. And I think that will be uh, the thing that will be very 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 important is we are, uh, um, we are we have uh, we need to have free markets. Not the many positions, not any barrier to enter to the markets. To uh, and uh, uh, via that we can improve entrepreneurship. But also we need to uh, just have a visions and work for the next generations. And I think the challenge for uh, Tunisia and all the countries uh, after after the COVID, how we can. Uh, work for the next generations and invest in, in the next generations because now with the digitalizations, the, the main challenge will be talents and talent that will be uh, how we, we, we invest in, in your, your human capital. Thank you. Thank you, Masri. And that's a very important point that when we talk about the role of private sector or business in transition, we're not necessarily talking about just engagement in the political process, but much more broadly uh, about building a better understanding within the society um, of the value of entrepreneurship, of why private sector growth ultimately uh, may provide a, a, a better um, path to transition and long-term um, development, sustainability, uh, inclusivity, and so on. 
Um, let me turn it over to Ali for his perspective from Pakistan. Well, of the private sector, uh, do you uh, see it now or as you would like to uh, see it in the future um, in support of um, democratic transition? Yeah, um, I think um, uh, very important uh, points have been raised uh, by my co-panelists here, and I could see some uh, similarities between at least uh, the Mexican case uh, when it comes to the political economy um, and sort of rent-seeking uh, activities of the business elite uh, when they can actually turn to politicians and the state to, to maximize their own benefits. Uh, so that has been happening. Um, and uh, to this date, uh, we haven't seen a sort of a dent in that system. Uh, as I said in the beginning, we have seen uh, changes, at least as far as the political leadership is concerned, but um, to which extent that has led to, uh, you know, steps towards a systematic change is still a question mark. And to give um, uh, one example, uh, one specific example, um, so it's a very important political leader in, in, in the ruling party, um, uh, he is um, like a, you know, known as a sugar baron uh, or a sugar lord in the country, one of the richest, and um, is also the one of the main financing fin uh, financer of the ruling party, Jangir Tareen. And uh, now he is uh, uh, facing um, an inquiry, an anti-corruption inquiry. And it's, it's a test case for the government uh, in terms of whether, you know, uh, how this case is handled because, the, um, you know, he represents the traditional wealth creation class of, of Pakistan where, um, uh, you know, the wealth can be created uh, from the political connections. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we also see uh, the emergence of a new uh, entrepreneurial class in the country. Uh, we see emergence of a new private sector in the country, uh, particularly in the fields of information technology, the field of media, uh, private education, um, and, and retail sector. So some of these sectors are uh, growing very fast uh, as compared with the traditional uh, sectors. And they are not dependent on, uh, let's say the connections with the government or the political connections. They are, uh, they are some of them are well linked in, in, in terms of their international, uh, you know, uh, supply chains and they are able to compete better in terms of their product. Um, and I, I, I hope and I believe that if they can organize, uh, you know, these business sectors can organize themselves uh, as voices of, of reform, as voices of uh, the institutional change in the system, they can build the right kind of pressure on the, on the politicians, on the bureaucracy, to, to deliver, because you know, if all, all this, all the talks of, of political change and, and democratic change and democratic transition uh, is very nice, but if it fails to uh, uh, to ensure an inclusive approach to prosperity, where, uh, as you mentioned also, and then your one of your remarks, uh, the little guy, where those entrepreneurs who are not connected with the system can also go up the ladder. Then, uh, then I'm afraid the, uh, the people uh, who had uh, hoped for change uh, by voting this government would be very disappointed if they still see the sources of uh, wealth creation are in the hands of the traditional wealth creation uh, elite. So there is, I think, what is, uh, in, therefore we need reforms. Uh, we, we need a very strong and very deep rooted uh, reform in the taxation system, in, this, in, in, in the tariff uh, system. Pakistan is still one of the most uh, protected uh, economies of the world, according to the World Bank uh, the definitions. And so we, we still are uh, protecting our traditional uh, businesses at the cost of these new rising businesses. 
so I think that is important for democratic transition to be successful. We need a new emergent private sector to be equally um, powerful, if not now in, in the near future. Um, and on the other hand, I think the second part of your question, what needs, uh, what they need to do, what private sector needs to do. Now, uh, my experience as a, as a think tank, uh, where I often navigate between this space, um, uh, between, let's say, the space between the government and the private sector. Sometimes we are approached by the government, sometimes we are approached by the private sector uh, for consultations and uh, for sharing our views or, or doing some research. And I'm afraid that uh, uh, the demand from the private sector in terms of uh, doing uh, good independent research, even if it is helpful for them, is not very strong. And uh, the private sector broadly is still driven by uh, the traditional ideas of, uh, of a business association where they can lobby, uh, where they can uh, you know, call the private secretary of the finance minister, arrange a meeting and get uh, what they want. Now, um, this may serve them for one fiscal year, but uh, another fiscal year, the next fiscal year comes another business lobby and they get appointment and then they get uh, privileges. So this cycle is going on. So to break that cycle, we need a private sector or voices in the private sector who are interested and genuinely invested in reforms. And for that, you need... Uh, Good research you need, and, and I, I believe this is slightly self-serving, I must admit, but uh, you need still um, those uh, well-argued and clearly researched um, voices backing up reforms in, in the context of uh, you know, local dynamics. So that I don't see um, happening, uh, and I think uh, that, that change is needed in the attitude of the private sector also. Thank you so much, Ali. And that was an excellent shout out to uh, economic think tanks and the need for um, fact-based uh, informed policymaking. Um, in a moment, also, I'll, um, I'll, I'll share a, a resource that uh, may be of relevance featuring, among others, uh, Ali, your work. Uh, that's the guide that I published um, a while ago on um, economic think tanks and sort of experiences from around the world, how they can contribute to um, transitions and also to uh, strengthen themselves as uh, institutions that contribute to democratic dialogue. Um, let me give the final word on the subject to Abigail. And Abigail, feel free to address the question of the role of the private sector in transitions, either from the local perspective we've been taking so far, uh, or maybe step back and talk about uh, also the role of the broader international uh, community um, that works in the um, democracy uh, support space. Your choice. Thanks, Anna. Um, so I just want to pick up where Ali left off. Um, I think that, um, as he said um, in his comments, if the little guy isn't able to compete in the system, um, if the wealth holders um, that have been the wealth holders, the elite, continue to hold all of the strings of economic advancement, then I think it will backfire. Um, even the companies that are doing well in today's economy will end up uh, finding themselves in an increasingly polarized, populist, authoritarian setting um, in which there is very, very little room to maneuver. Um, so I think we've all discussed the reasons why businesses should be speaking out on behalf of reform. Um, but the question is, um, as Luis said, how do we pivot uh, from businesses as spectators to as protagonists? Um, what would be required to actually have businesses be more active in pushing for reform? Um, and I think part of the challenge is that from a business perspective, um, it's unclear how the political winds may shift in the future. So a risk-adverse business leader in a particular country may have the calculation, yes, we prefer the reform-minded new leader, but if we come out swinging against the old guard then and the reformists lose, then we may find ourselves quite isolated in the future, or even worse, we might find ourselves targeted 
um, by the old guard when they reclaim the reins of government control. Um, so it's an understandable um, calculus from their perspective why they may choose to sit on the sidelines and um, wait to see you know, how things evolve um, as opposed to be an active protagonist in pushing for reform. So I think the question for us collectively is what would it take to help mitigate the risk so that businesses can speak out in a more um, risk prone or uh, brave uh, way? How could they find the interest in doing so. And I think part of the answer is certainly in collective action, maybe not the um, kind of old school version that Ali described of, of a business association that represents a very narrow set of interests, but maybe a sort of reform-minded coalition, um, something broader we're certainly seeing in the anti-corruption space, um, the development of some collective action mechanisms that are able to speak in one voice and um, exert some influence on particular countries, on particular uh, municipalities, um, certainly in certain sectors, um, as we see with the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network. So I think that can help enable an individual company to not feel so isolated in stepping out on a limb. It also can be powerful for businesses to build alliances with the diplomatic corps, um, and in that way find allies who are vocal proponents of reform from the international community and sort of exert pressure from the bottom up and the top down uh, in a coordinated fashion in pushing for the reforms that um, are collectively evidence-based and, um, and clear that they're needed. Um, and, and I think international business associations can also come under that. The American Chamber of Commerce, for example, um, can play a powerful role in highlighting the need for reform and the uh, potential economic rewards that new governments can make um, if they uh, create a more predictable rules-based business climate. Um, but my last thought is about uh, whether businesses can make direct connections to consumers about this. Can uh, consumers, citizens in, in many cases, uh, essentially reward businesses who are willing to take a stand, who are able to step out and be brave and, and stand on the side of justice in these pivotal moments um, and be rewarded not just uh, morally, but also economically um, and get some um, kind of more direct dividends from customers who are more likely to support them perhaps because of their public stance in favor of reform. Um, and uh, I, I haven't actually seen this um, play out in practice. I'd be curious if other panelists have done ha have seen it play out. Um, but it occurs to me that it could be one way to help mitigate some of the risk of standing on the side of reform during these moments. Thank you so much, Rivette. And also just uh, to briefly look back to uh, something you mentioned in your opening uh, remarks uh, that maybe not everybody in the audience is, is familiar with. Um, the Crook Act, and that sort of speaks to the type of support uh, that may come from the uh, international community. Uh, we don't quite have the time to go into depth into what uh, that piece of legislation is, but I will ask our technical moderator to share the link to an excellent event I posted just last week with uh, Senator Ben Cardin, Abigail herself, uh, other notable speakers like uh, Delia Ferreira from uh, Transparency International, on that precise issue, I highly recommend it if you weren't able to catch it. Um, with that, uh, we'll move uh, to our uh, Q&A. Uh, and let's start by um, taking a quick uh, pulse um, of the audience. We have a, a poll uh, um, question uh, for you. Uh, and the question is, what should be the most important priorities for private sector businesses to support democratic transition? Um, and you should be seeing that question uh, shared uh, shortly. Uh, please pick up to three responses and let's take maybe a minute to do that. Um, let's see, we have some responses coming in already. Um, I think in many respects, echoing uh, the priorities that we have been discussing here on the panel. Um, right, with the top ones, uh, Private businesses should do more to engage community stakeholders and support civil society. Um, private businesses promoting civic education among employees and others. That is just what we were talking about, this is creating demand for certain types of business um, 
behaviors and, and uh, business operations with integrity. Uh, and I'm saying the third top one as private businesses should become more active in politics, uh, safeguarding democracy and freedom. Uh, also, we touched upon that when we spoke about collective um, action. Um, very, uh, very interesting insights. Um, with that, so let's turn to our Q&A. And the top question, or actually, I think the, the first, the top two questions really can be combined into one. And they have to do with the impact of the COVID-19 um, pandemic on democracies. Uh, so um, let me just uh, read them for everybody's reference. Um, in the aftermath of the pandemic, democracies are mostly regressing uh, for the first time in 50 years. The question is that democ um, the democratic transitions today are in a direction away from democracy, you know, question marks. So sort of, are we seeing the long-term danger to, to democracy that has been uh, accelerated by COVID uh, globally? Uh, and then uh, so the follow on to that, has the pandemic changed your perception on what is integral to a healthy democracy? Um, I think we can, uh, you know, uh, if anyone who has thought uh, on that, uh, I'll um, let them just jump in. Otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll ask somebody to uh, share their thoughts. I can kick off. Uh, go ahead. Um, and then it looks like Luis is um, ready to go as well. Um, so I think uh, the pandemic, we have seen um, actually even before the pandemic, a rise in civic mobilization and mass protests, as I mentioned, um, according to um, some of the statistics out of VDEM, um, which is uh, the Varieties of Democracy Index, 2019, right before the pandemic, was the highest number of mass protests globally around the world. So um, I think one of the questions referenced um, the 15 year decline in democracy um, and Freedom House and others have tracked that um, closely and it's a very disturbing set of trends. Um, but I, I think it's worth us acknowledging that there is um, uh, increase in repression and there's an increase in fighting back both at the same time. Um, and so we have to take seriously both the, the sort of fighting back instincts as well as um, the disturbing autocratic tendencies. Um, and the pandemic, I think, in certain ways has heightened the salience of the civic grievances that people have. It's kind of um, brought to light the failures of governments in many cases to be able to respond adequately to citizen needs. So I think we can expect as restrictions start to ease in various countries, um, hopefully, uh, as, as vaccinations become more available, I think we can expect even more of this civic mobilization um, at a faster rate. And I think the real question is how um, that window of opportunity moment, as I referenced at the beginning, where there is a high amount of pressure in the system for advancing on reforms, how can international actors stand in solidarity with citizens and with businesses who are aligned with these sort of movements to push for reform during those very brief windows? Because um, emergencies don't last forever and windows of opportunity definitely don't as well. And I think um, we can expect that uh, the, the pressure will be declining uh, as we move farther away from the pandemic. And so how to seize on the momentum while it's here is an important consideration for us all. Absolutely. And Louise, you had something else to add here? Yeah, I, I mean, as Abigail says, uh, democracy has been under attack for some time uh, and COVID has further undermined it, uh, which strengthens non-democratic actors. Uh, and people, by definition, demand solutions and relief and care less about how it is provided, which strengthens tough leaders who challenge key democratic institutions, those creating a vicious circle. This, in, in conceptual terms, should be a perfect opportunity for reform, but that's exactly the opposite of what the typical populist and tough-minded leader wants to, to get. Um, uh, that's not true for every country in the world, but that's, I think, a, a general line that we're being, we've been seeing in, in, in many a country around the world. We see it in several European countries, certainly in most uh, Latin American countries, and in some Asian countries as well. Thank you.
so much. Um, unfortunately, we're uh, running out of time, but I wanted to take the next uh, top voted question as an opportunity for uh, Mashdi and Ali to give us their uh, closing thought for the entire panel, since the question really uh, is broad and goes back to many issues we discussed. Um, the question, uh, it sounds like a big part of accelerating democratic transition is improving governance and public service delivery. How do we do this? Uh, what role can private sector play? We addressed it to some extent. Uh, what is the impetus for companies or government to create independent, transparent institution uh, in uh, you know, one minute or less? Um, it must be, go ahead. One minute, I just uh, uh, like to just to mention two points. The first one is the stagflation phenomenon now in the around the world. We have, uh, the problem is how we can rebuild confidence because uh, the problem is we have now problem in terms of consumptions and people, they have all the citizens, they have to come back to the, their normal life and consume uh, normally because if not, we don't have market and we don't have growth. And the second part is also uh, uh, in terms of offers company they have to continue to, to, to produce and for this what, what we see around the world is we have uh, recessions and on the same time high high level of, of inflations and I think the cause of all of that is one one thing is how to rebuild confidence in the system and for that uh, making reform and especially reform in terms of governance is very is, is very important. My second point is, uh, you know, they are uh, the story of um, the, uh, the farm families, and you have the eldest son who work hard, but uh, uh, in all the family, all the other members, they just tell him what they have to do, what they have to behave, what they have to think, but they forget all the hard works and uh, the value and the foods and the dinner they just break it by this end's son, and I think we have just uh, um, to uh, just to consider the role of the private sector in the economy and, and in the states. I I believe that the private sectors they have uh, to be not involved directly and be very, very close to the to, to 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 political parties, but we we need in the countries and in all the countries to know uh, what, what uh, the role of the private sectors, because if, if not, we have a problem of, uh, uh, because after that, the state, what they do, they just, they have the systems, uh, the taxes, etc., to make, uh, uh, to, uh, to revenue distributions, but they distribute what? They distribute uh, part of the value created by by the private sector, except for the country, they have the state, uh, they have natural resource, and they have strong state of enterprise. But for, for all the others, uh, we need we need the private sectors. And I think uh, uh, the story of the eldest son is very important. Don't forget his role. Thank you. Thank you so much. Grow, grow the pie and then uh, and then share it. Ali, very briefly, your final thoughts. Uh, yes, very quickly. Um, I think Pakistani government uh, overall has uh, managed well in terms of their response to COVID. Um, particularly, I would like to highlight uh, the coordination in different, uh, you know, is federal and uh, provincial agencies. Uh, despite the political differences, uh, you know, Pakistan has, has this politically comparative culture. But uh, overall, uh, uh, the health system has uh, been mobilized um, uh, to actually, you know, through, uh, I, they have called smart lockdowns, temporary lockdowns to, to, to manage the spread. Um, and then the government has also actually involved the private sector to begin with uh, through special incentives and concessions and, um, and also financial assistance. Um, I think broadly this has been appreciated by the private sector uh, in terms of what government could offer given its fiscal limitation. Um, and, and, and then in the in last few months, it's uh, vaccination drive slow to begin with, but now it has picked up uh, quite well. And we hope that um, you know, we move uh, to a level where majority of the population which needs to be vaccinated will be vaccinated. 
Thank you, Ellie, and many thanks to everybody on the panel. Excellent conversation. I'm sure we could have spent an hour, hour at least, uh, uh, continuing on that topic. Uh, many thanks also to the audience for your questions and for your engagement. Uh, I do encourage you to visit uh, virtual booths uh, in the showcase section of uh, our platform. And please join us for our uh, remaining sessions of this conference. And uh, many thanks again. Uh, take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.